Welcome everyone to the Her Wire Salon. We are at our third Tuesday's event where you know what it's all about. We are bringing you salon talks with some of our powerhouse women. And I'm like, I'm like over the moon excited for today's guest. And we're going to get right into it. I am here with, is it Yvonne or Yvonne? Yvonne. Thank you for asking. It's Yvonne. It's Yvonne. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So <laughs> Yvonne is the CEO of Captivate Marketing Group, and she leads a highly creative, she's a certified, the highly creative certified entertainment marketing professional and Emmy nominated event producer. Yvonne has a proven track record of conceptualizing and orchestrating small and large production events, marketing campaigns, and programs to effectively create business development opportunities, increase revenue and growth. Yvonne is known as the powerhouse behind the scenes, closing deals, structuring, sculpting entertainment, one exquisite experience at a time. She has worked with some of the biggest names and brands in the entertainment industry from grassroots organizations, Fortune 500 companies and A-list artist. Yvonne started her career early in the music industry under the mentorship of Esther Gordy Edwards, sister of Barry Gordy and creator of the Motown Museum. At the age of 22, Yvonne was featured on the cover of Cranes Magazine as someone to watch in the industry. Uh, the tutelage from Miss Gordy Edwards proved as an on-ramp for her career and I'm excited to have you here today. Thank you for being here. I wish I had Thank a sound. You for having <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It is it is more than my pleasure to have you here. I that that list of accolades, I am so honored and like I'm so pleased and touched that you would take time from your busy schedule. Uh, to to talk to us and to speak with our members here at Her Sweet Spot. It, I really appreciate you spending the time with me today. I want to get right into how I became familiar with you, Yvonne, through, through 2020, through the pandemic. I just want to share with everyone how you just started appearing in my feed. I don't know if friends were um, sharing your content on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, we were connected, I think. And then I just started seeing all of the interviews that you were having. You took the pandemic and you turned it into really a, a, a really great time and an escape from all the mental stress that people were having. That's how you affected me during that time because I was going through my own, oh my God, worries of what was happening in our in our country and i'm from new york and watching you and listening to you and your experiences as a new yorker as well and sharing your your journey what was happening in manhattan i just i it just you helped me escape and some of your guests were so phenomenal that it truly helped me put aside all of the stress and, and mental anguish that i was going through um, at the time. Thank you so much for doing that. What led you to use your platform? And, and I should add that, I mean, every A-list person you could think of was on this platform just sharing insights with people. What made you pivot your your, your platform in that way? You know, it's, it's, it's actually really interesting. Um, so a couple years ago, I had this Facebook show, which is what you started seeing during the pandemic. And everybody used to say like, when are you gonna bring the Facebook show? And I, and I kept saying like, I'm too busy with my day job. So on March 13th, which is when everything kind of started crumbling, my world started crumbling. And I think for most people, I said, well, you know, we're gonna be in the house probably for a month. So I'm gonna bring back my Facebook show. And so I started on March 14th. And, um, and I said, I'm just gonna have conversations with my friends and just do this for the next month while we're in the house, you know, until we're out of this, you know, pandemic. <laughs> so yeah. how, how silly was I to think it would only be a month. So I, so I started doing it and I ended up doing a hundred shows. Um, uh, and, you know, and it was actually quite crazy, but, you know, you talked about for you, obviously it was, it, it was actually keeping me sane because for someone in the live events industry, you know, March 13th, I had, 
been, you know, I'm one of the producers on Essence Music Festival and I had been in the office and we were about to make a big announcement that I was like, super excited for on March 14th. And so when things started crumbling and every time you turned on the TV, it was like there are no live events, no live events, no live events. I was, you know, I was really sad and it really helped me make it through because for the first couple of months, um, you know, as the 30 days turned to 60 and turned to 90, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I was literally crying some days before I even got onto the show because that was all I had to do. Um, yeah. Because everybody kept saying like pivot, pivot. And I was like, I don't really understand what that means for me right now. And so that's how I started the show. And um, so, yeah, but the response was really actually overwhelming. But I was just having conversations with my friends and people I've worked with over the years. And, and it was such a, I relate so much to what you just said. I, I host an, a, a live event and a lot of my work and my coaching is done virtually. And I really thought I was going to shut down business because I had to become a homeschool teacher of a, of a kindergartner at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was going through it myself, but then I, I actually saw how much my how much more my clients needed my support, mm -hmm. and the industry in general with women entrepreneurs getting left out of PPP and all. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't give up now. So I I completely understand um, the the time you were in as well. So I want to just start getting into because um, everyone knows we have Marjorie and Erica watching. They say hello um, from our hello. Facebook group. Uh, <laughs> everyone knows that I'm 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 getting better at keeping these at under thirty minutes. So I want to oh. get into the meat of your career and and all of the success you've had in this male domin dominated industry. In your um, bio, we talked about your mentor, Esther Gordy Edwards. And mm -hmm. how did you transition? And you were in the music um, side of the business and marketing before you actually uh -huh. got to event production. How did yep. you transition um, between those two careers? Sure. Well, I actually started in PR. Um, so I was, you know, working with very various labels and various artists. And um, I realized quickly that that wasn't the role for me. And it wasn't the role for me just because it's a hard role, you know, um, pitching, you know, artists and they're not, sometimes they didn't show up or sometimes they didn't want to do the interview. If you got the interview, I just, I didn't have the right temperament for it, but I've always had a love of music. So, I mean, really my, 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 love and passion is the music industry. And so I started producing concerts and started learning how to produce concerts. So those were really my first events and everything else that you see is like secondary or third, but, you know, music and concerts has always been, um, you know, my love and passion. So it was, it was quite easy because, you know, I was already within the music industry and then I just started, you know, watching everything and becoming a sponge and just like started volunteering and started being a PA you know, I just was doing everything to learn um, the 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 concert production business. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how I kind of got into it. And it's definitely male dominated, most times white male dominated. I, I, what? How many industries are not? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Being an African-American woman as you're climbing up the corporate ladder in, in that in that way, handling all those uh, roles and positions with someone like Esther Gordy Edwards as your mentor, a female mm -hmm. at that, how did she, or what advice did she give you as you were navigating your career in order for you to make it and fight against all of these males? Well, you know what? Um, she was very strong and, you know, people think I'm tall, but I'm only 5'1". And she was also like, I no, think she wait, was- wait, 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 can we stop right there? No, you're not. <laughs> like- I am, I'm only 5'1". Real, like I would think that you were the tallest person in the room. <laughs> People always think that. People always think that I was. Yeah, they always think I'm gonna be like six foot two or something. But yes, I'm only five one, and she's like you know five feet as well. And also, she worked with a lot of men. But you know, I you know I was so young at the time. But I just remember how. Not that I'm not young now, but I was so young, and she would just come over to my house, and she would just like tell all these stories. But really, I mean. Everything that I use today is what I learned from her in terms of marketing, in terms of being persistent, in terms of speaking up for yourself. Those are all the things like I really owe everything about 
how I moved to her and my parents, you know, because she really mm -hmm. taught me so much. And I use a lot of those techniques now. And obviously you, and you know, you use stuff that's modern, like, you know, you apply it to what you're doing right now, but a lot of the, that the methods that Motown, you know, how they did and how they groomed those artists and how they worked with artists and, and, um, you know, even working with brands too. It, I learned that from her. Absolutely. How pivotal was it to have a woman as that sponsor and that mentor? How, how do you think you would have been, you most likely you definitely would have been as far as you are, but have you, have you ever had any males, male mentors, the way she mentored you? And no, no, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. I never, no, I've never, I've never had a, a male mentor in the same way that she was. Like I have men in my life that give me advice that I can go to and I can have conversations, but she really took me under her wing. I mean, it's so funny because there's this picture, it's on my Instagram of me with her and I'm like dressed like her. And I was like, why were you dressed like that 60 year old woman? Like I was trying to be her, you know, right. like she really just took me and, and and I even had regrets like later because you know, when you're young, you don't, you know, I should have recorded conversations or I should have done this, you know, because she would just come over and I would just sit there listening to stories. I mean, even, you know, like stories about Diana Ross, Smokey Robinson, even Mary Wilson, Mary Wilson actually, you know, who recently passed away came to my right. home before when I was wow. young. So it was just, she was just really immersing me into, you know, understanding how the music industry works and how it works for women um, mm -hmm. as well. So no, she really, um, she she really became like a second mother to me, to be quite honest. So no, I've never had that from, from a uh, man. That is so uh, interesting and fascinating. What do you think that, were men intimidated by you or it, you because you had a foundation and kind of you knew who you were and, and where you belonged and the community and the tribe that was built around you were you not seeking sponsorship from men and you know what made you so strong to not need a man's validation is kind of what what i wanted that's my mom you know my mom dead that are together they've been married 50 something years and um but my mom i have three sisters my mom and dad really they they just raised us to never have to wait for anybody to be able to do anything you need to do on your own you know not that i don't want a man to do those things to me but i'm if i need to get it done i'll get it done so it's really just in my upbringing as well um but you know i think in terms of the question of are men intimidated by me um yeah absolutely absolutely i'm you know people will name nameless but I, you know i'm working on a project now and i'm the the first woman and the first black woman to ever work on this project. And, you know, I find them to be very intimidate, intimidated by me and, you know, often can be condescending. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and, and I actually find joy in that because it's a great opportunity for me to show them that, show them that I'm no more than them. <laughs> I, I work in FinTech. And so mm -hmm. I resonate with a lot of what you're saying, very he heavily male dominated field, white male, dominated and women are, are now finding their way up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And I have had the hardest time with finding men who support me and and and, and will sponsor. You know, last year at the Harass Conference, we talked a lot about mentorship versus sponsorship and how sponsorship and having people advocate for you when you're not in the room makes such a difference. Um, have you had any sponsors that really help boost your business, your career and your business? And how important has that been to you? I was muting because definitely, you know, you know, we're in New York. So there's a lot of we're in New York. So you can always tell I can never lie about being in New York. There's some sirens going by. But um, I do. I do. Ha I have a lot of people who advocate for me. First of all, you know, um, for many years, I wouldn't do any interviews. I wouldn't do any features or anything because I was just so focused on building my business and building my reputation. And thankfully, you know, and I was, I'm always so thankful because people are mentioning my name in rooms when I'm not there and mm -hmm. speaking up for me and advocating for me. And, you know, so a lot of my business is actually word of mouth because I have people who advocate for me. I don't do 
a lot of marketing other than what I post on social media. But um, yeah, I do. I do have people who advocate for me, but they advocate for me because they know that I'm going to show up. I'm going to do the work and I'm going to do my best no matter who the client is, big or small. That That's so I love what you just said about you were so focused on building the business and your reputation that you wouldn't do interviews and you had people waiting to share your story and wanting to put you out there for exposure. What would you say to people? Because a lot of my clients and entrepreneurs, all they look for is exposure. And I'm the one that, like you, I'm running my business and I'm not out here. Although this year I'm, I'm hoping to make that change. But these past seven years, I haven't been trying to be in the limelight, so to speak, up front. How were you able to maintain that focus in especially having the Rolodex that you have? How, how can you maintain such a cool and calm ego? Like I, I feel through watching you, I was able to connect with you through social media and then felt comfortable because it's not everyone I feel comfortable without a direct um, uh, introduction. A lot of my executive, a lot of the leaders such as yourself that I have on my platform, I've been introducing, I, I build a network around it, but I kind of cold called you and, and been mm -hmm. following you. How were you able to build that? Um, I don't know if it's resiliency or, 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 you know what I mean? Like you're so down to earth, but you've got everything that people are like wishing they could have in, the, in their sphere of, of uh, resources. You know, I think for me, um, you know, because I've had to work very hard, you know, um, I've had to work very hard. I had to do all types of jobs. And I um, I think that I don't get caught up in it. I think that, first of all, I love what I do. And I don't ever get caught up in who's in my Rolodex or, you know, who I'm speaking to. You know, I keep it, I keep it very confidential. Um, and I just don't ever get caught up into it because I think when you get caught up into it, you lose sight of, you know, what you're really here to do and your purpose. And I don't ever want to lose sight of that. And so with that, you know, my relationships, I mean, people trust me, you know, they trust me. They trust me like no other. I'm super loyal and they trust me that they know that if they need something from me or if they're calling me for something, then it's not going to be, you know, on TMZ or, you know, whatever the case may be. I just really stay focused on I have a purpose and I know that I want to work a certain way and work with people a certain way. And it's not short time for me. You know, many of the people that I work with, if you talk to them, they've probably worked with me and known me for many years. Um, so I, I think that that's so important that you just don't get caught up. Um, you know, I think with social media, it's easy to do that um, and to feel the pressure to do that. But I've never, I've never felt that. I mean, it took me so long to even, you know, I mean, literally people were asking me to do interviews for years and I, I would decline because I just didn't, I just didn't want to be perceived other than what I really am. Right. And um, I think sometimes you get caught up and, and the perception can be really off. Right. Turning back into your early career in PR and pitching, I'm all about um, in her sweet spot, we deal with mindset, money, marketing and media. And I really do help are uh, my clients and women in the network and men uh, in the network really hone in on getting media, but not so much worrying about the traditional high level media, right? There's many mm -hmm. sources of media. What is your recommendation as to how people can navigate getting, reaching out, pitching and or doing their own work and not necessarily who people who may not have the budget for publicists? Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that and I, I would also say like all the press, you know, that I've received and I, I'm fortunate this received some great press. I've, I mean, it's all just been either someone reaching out to me or me having a conversation. But I think that when you are really um, clear in what your business vision or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, if you're pitching, you know, service, business, whatever, if you're really clear on it and can really have a good pitch in terms of like, you know, this is what I do. This is who I help. I think it's actually quite easy. I think people, you know, probably have a block and think it's harder than it is, but it's not harder. It's not hard if you're able to really just sell yourself and be authentic in it. I think people um, navigate and are drawn to that. So I don't think, you know, 
yes, it's great if you can afford a publicist, but you should be able to tell your own story. You know, um, I don't know if you know Michelle G. Um, she was just named CEO yeah. of NeJet, but yeah, she's she's a great friend of mine, and she and she always says that you know people know their company mission, but rarely know their own. And so it's like when you know, and I think that's so true. When you know your mission and you can speak on your mission, I think it's a lot easier to pitch yourself to 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 do anything. So your 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 personal mission versus your personal values, which are two separate things. Mm -hmm. Knowing that your personal mission connects you. I think that's so spot on. I, people often tell me, why don't you publicize some of the things that you do in the spaces that you you enter? Because it doesn't define me. I'm, I'm really, truly yep. just trying to impact as many people as I can mm -hmm. with the work I'm doing. So I feel and resonate with your um, your sentiments a lot. So we have a lot of coaches and consultants on the call. And mm -hmm. they are in a place of looking to really build out their thought leadership in their profession, in their field. How, if you have any advice on building thought leadership, and I think you just said it is really just connecting and being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Using social media as a way. What What are some recommendations uh, you may have, or what are some of the things you do to just connect with uh, a new set of audience on social media? Um, you know what? I, you know, I don't actually deliberately try to connect with new audiences. I just come as myself. And, you know, so I do that on, you know, anything, anything I post, you know, I'm, you know, some people, uh, you know, I have some friends who are like going on and on and on about, you know, what their caption is going to be. And I'm just like, I'm just saying what I think right now, because I right. know that it's not going to be anything that, you know, would, wouldn't be appropriate. So I just come as myself. Um, I don't, I don't want to ever send a representative in anything that I do because I want people, if they like me, they're going to like me based on me being me. So I never really set out to go after um, new audiences. And I'm always quite surprised when somebody is like, oh, I follow you or, oh, I, you know, this or that. I'm always like, me? Why? You know, so. Because <laughs> you're just, so, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a question, I had a new question in my head just now. I wanted to... Um, turn it back to something and I just made a joke and now I forgot yeah. what it is. So we have a few people that are watching now. Erica mm -hmm. says hi. Cheryl says hi. Nerese says hi. Guys, if you have any questions, Nerese is part of the behind the scenes. Oh, I do remember now what okay. I want to ask you. And hi, everyone. Building a team, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've watched some of your behind the scenes footage when you when you were doing now this new whole remote um, hosting or not hosting, but remote AV. Virtual. They're, virtual. They're virtual, uh -huh. right? mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're the one flipping the buttons for a conference. Like you have to have a mega team behind you, right? I, mm -hmm. I saw a couple of things where you were actually the, I guess, what do we call it? The set director or the person supporting the behind the scenes of, of a conference. And I saw mm -hmm. you with your multiple laptops and everything. How, did you, do you have a team? How big is your team? I do and have a team. Mm -hmm. what, what would you recommend to a lot of our solopreneurs that are in that space and trying to get to the next level? At what stage of your business did you say, you know what, I, I have to invest in teams and let me, let me put this money out here? You know, it's, it's quite interesting because I might have seen this meme because I saw I, I was saying it where the girl was like, it was like, oh, the receptionist. And she was like, hi. And then it was like the fulfillment center. And she was like, hi. And I was like, that used to be me. Like I was the receptionist. I was like, you know, I was doing everything. And you know what? I When I really looked at how do I scale my business, I cannot do everything. And I had to be willing to let go. And I had to be able to trust my team. So I have an amazing team. Um, an all female, black female team, let me just okay. say that. And um, which was extremely important to me um, that I worked with black women. And the reason is, is because there's not enough of us in production and I wanna make sure that there is. So my team is is 100% black women, which I, which I love. So I have a team of seven. And then I have, you know, a solid AV partner. So 
when I'm showing up for some of these events, um, you know, it's about 30, 35 of us in total, you know, to pull off some of these larger um, productions. But um, yeah, that's 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 how I do it. But it but during this time, I'm in my home office right now. But during this time, you know, I have built a control room in my um, home office, so I have all the you know the screens and multiple yeah. laptops, iPads. You know, I have everything yeah. here so that I can um, pr promote. I mean, produce from home. But I do go into the control room um, in Brooklyn for for some of my events. Now. Your industry was one of the top, other than things like restaurant and, and the medical field, that was impacted by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, uh, and we actually do have some members, Narice and Rudy, they are um, AV and production company mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that they are building and growing. How do you think your industry will rebound or is the virtual experience here to stay? I think I absolutely think virtual is here to stay um, for, you know, for 2021, third, fourth quarter, I am planning some hybrid events. But what I have found with virtual is that it's a great opportunity to extend your brand, brand reach. You know, events where I would have a thousand, two thousand people. Now I'm having over a hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand. So, yeah. So it really allows you to extend your brand reach. So it's hard to go back from that. You know, now now partners want to see those types of numbers. So I will be doing stuff live where I'll be live streaming from from events and allowing, you know, everyone to who who isn't comfortable or can't travel or whatever the reason may be, you know, because a lot of my events have now gone global because of being virtual. I'll definitely still keep that in play um, moving forward. I mean, there's I love, love, love live events. And sometimes I'm like sitting here scrolling, looking at pictures, like, look at us all maskless, having a good time, you know? And so I hope, you know, to to um, to go back to that way it was with large concerts and stuff like that, because again, that's my passion, but I do think um, it's virtual is here to stay. And so, you know, in that time where I was doing my show, where everybody was just like, just jump on Zoom. And, you know, I was like, that's not an event platform and that's not an event. That's when I took some time to like, you know, because sometimes you have to slow down and speed up. And so I stopped and was like really learning, you know, where now we're building platforms and websites and, you know, doing all these things that I never thought I would be doing before. So, yeah, I think virtual is here to stay. I love what you just said. Slow down to speed up. That's a drop. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys watching. And I say this to my clients all the time and they're like, no, but, 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 but I'm ready to make this kind of money. So if you want to do that, we have to slow down so you can mm -hmm. get to and some of my clients that are on right now, they're like yep. shaking their head saying, that's what she says all the time. Yep. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. We want to do so much and we want to do it so fast. And yeah. sometimes you need to just stop. You need to organize. You need to evaluate. You need to restructure. You know, sometimes you have to do that. And I'm not saying, you know, do it to your detriment. I mean, I know we all have bills to pay. But sometimes, you know, we cannot always be juggling and moving from this to that. And, and I think that's what COVID has been a teacher for a lot of us is that we were forced to sit down. So I think that it was a great opportunity to, you know, really like look at your business or look at your job or just look at your family, whatever the case may be, and figure it out. I hear the sirens. Yeah. And it <laughs> Good distraction in, in the background. I like it. We're, we're you, most of us, well, not everybody's from New York, but some of us that are, we understand. I, yeah. so, you know, we're, we're almost at that time. I'm trying to control it because I could talk all day to you. Actually. Oh, this went so quick. It went really quick. <laughs> it goes by right so fast. But I wanted to, so a lot of our, um, our, our viewers are navigating between workplace and entrepreneurship. Was there a time where you were in the middle, where you were building your brand and your business while maintaining your your job? And really, what advice can you give us to have the proper mindset while you're doing both? What mindset okay. were you, you living in? Yes, absolutely. I was in the middle. And so I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you a really short story, and then I'm gonna tell you how I do it. So when I was in corporate America, because I, I was in corporate America doing marketing and events and stuff like that, and early on in my career, I decided that. I was not suited for that. You know, I wanted to go out and, you know, continue to 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 freelance or start a business. I just did not want to work in that type of environment. And yeah. so one of my good friends who was my hype man, she was just like, cause I was like, they don't value me. They don't, you know, I just don't, I'm not appreciated. And she was like, you're right. And one day I just got up and I left my cubicle and I walked out the door. 
And that was the dumbest thing I could have ever done. And so <laughs> thank you for saying that last part. <laughs> It was so dumb. And so I always tell people because people think it's that easy. And I yeah. thought it was that easy. Like I could just walk out the door and I could just become an entrepreneur. And so I quickly had to go back to work. And it was years later because what I started to do was like I had that in my mind where I knew my end goal was that I wanted to start my own business and being an entrepreneur. And so I went back to work and I focused on it and I learned and I went back to grad school and I just tried to figure out how to structure a business. And so I started building clients. And so, you know, I literally would work full time and then work and stay up late and, you know, work on the weekends. But I started building up a clientele until I was comfortable because I didn't have the luxury of someone just investing or, you know, giving me money where I could leave. So I built up clients and then I became an entrepreneur. So don't just leave your cubicle or your office, you know, build up, um, you know, however you can and, and get the tools that you need. I mean, going back to grad school, you know, I didn't go right from undergrad to grad school. I went back and I was able to take what I was learning to be able to apply it directly to building my business. So um, so that's 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 how I how I was able to go from, you know, working in corporate environment to um, having my own business. And it's been 13 years now. So you just said you built your client list and then became an entrepreneur. I, I picked up what you was putting down. Can you <laughs> explain your mindset then? Did you not believe you were an entrepreneur or do you have a different um impression of what an entrepreneur, the, the term, everybody's a CEO, mm -hmm. about the, every, they, they put labels on things, but I like how you framed it. You built your business, so you were running your business, but then you saw yourself as an entrepreneur. Can you give us just a little insight as to what that means? Yeah, because I mean, I, I do think that everybody thinks that, I mean, this entrepreneur life is not for the weak at heart, you know, like it's, it's a responsibility, especially if you do want to have a team and making sure you're paying that team and make sure you're taking care of that team and making sure you can trust that is so much to it, especially when you go through highs and lows and, you know, who knew a pandemic would hit. But there's a different mindset that you have to have, um, I believe, to be a successful entrepreneur. And so it took me some time. I might have had an entrepreneurial spirit, but mm -hmm. it took me some time to gather the tools that I needed to be successful. And so that's why when I left that for the last time, um, when I left that time, you know, I was able to, um, you know, really start growing my business and um, never looking back, you know, because I was able to really grow, uh, you know, and get solid in terms of being an entrepreneur and, and running my own business. You just dropped another one on me and you probably don't even know, but I'm I picking up. Know. <laughs> you, you had the entrepreneurial spirit. So oftentimes people are throwing around this entrepreneurial spirit, right? Especially in corporate America, bring on your entrepreneurial spirit, but they don't want to really validate and, and promote you with that same spirit. They want you to come into, on, into corporate America with the spirit doesn't equal the full rewards of being an entrepreneur. There is a difference. So I'm That's glad. Different. You, I'm mm -hmm. glad you said that. We have a couple of comments from our uh, viewers. Jennifer says she loved the necessity of a team and slowing down conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Dr. Jen, I should say. Question, what is the difference between our attitude versus people attitudes towards communication with others to collaborate? That's a great question and just leads to the conversation of collaboration in general. Mm -hmm. um, what are your uh, your feedback for that? I mean, I think I think collaboration is really key to being able to scale. I mean, we can't be afraid to partner with people and we have to be insecure in what we do so that we can partner. Because I think a lot of times it's a little insecurity when you are afraid to collaborate and partner and you feel that you got to like control everything and make sure. But someone can take my idea, but that doesn't mean they're going to be able to execute it the way I would execute it. So I am very secure in the services that I provide, how I do it, how I came up with it. You know, because someone tried to say they came up with my idea and I was like, I came, this is how I came up with it. And I gave them exactly how. And I was like, well, how did you come up with it? You know, so you can you can absolutely try and take an idea of mine, but that, you know, you're not going to execute it the same way. So I am not afraid of collaboration if it's going to help me scale and help me expose my business to other opportunities or other people that I might necessarily um, reach. So I think collaboration is, is key. 
to scaling. And I say scaling a lot because I think sometimes as black people, we don't ha always have that in mind. We're trying to maintain, but we're not trying to scale. And right. so I'm trying to continuously think about how do I get to the next level? And I'm always going to try and maintain, but I also want to be thinking about big, being bigger, thinking bigger. Right. Right. Which is what I say the difference between a small business owner and an entrepreneur does. Small business right. owner, they look to keep the lights on. They look to, you know, get things uh, uh, week to week, month to month versus an mm -hmm. entrepreneur who is looking for that longevity and that growth. Um, so we say we have Marjorie, do you use a decorator florist on your set when you're hosting uh, or producing events? Um, yeah, I definitely I use, uh, you know, it depends on the event. Um, but yeah, I do. I use a uh, florist and I also, um, so I'm trained in event design, so I'm certified. So I do come up with my own designs and renders um, for events, but absolutely I use um, companies that can be able to execute and do the fabrication for those sets. <laughs> Marjorie is the owner of Emily Florals and she does um, event uh, decorating and floral design. And she's done it for the Her Rise conference for the last few years. So uh, awesome. she is, she's pretty awesome. I think uh, Susan says, I work in a large entertainment center and lost her job in March. And she knows what kind of job uh, she wants, what she don't want. And she's mm -hmm. looking for a virtual customer service job, no intention of going back to the office. I have, um, I hate the office politics. Yes. There's a lot of that that goes on. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we're, we have any other followers. Um, someone says on um, how others can follow us in the beginning. Oh, how, how can others follow us in the beginning of our business? So the, the question is more towards a, a really early stage startup, mm -hmm. how to get um, followers, I think on social media. Yeah. See, for me, like, again, I didn't, I never deliberately go after followers. I do the work and I feel like it comes organically. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't ever, I, I don't have advice on that because I just focus on the work and then, you know, the followers come, the projects come, the money come, you know, I just focus on doing great work. So I, I never, I never take that approach on um, building followers, but and I know I think it works for some. Mm -hmm. It does work for a lot, and, and I don't do the I don't do that either. I have a social media team because we need to stay connected and engaged to people. But mm -hmm. I've got all my business through referrals, just the same way, and yeah. through my live interactions. I mm -hmm. before COVID, obviously, I travel the country, going to other people's conferences, mm -hmm. attending, being in the room where my potential partners and clients were, so that I can meet new people in order to continuously generating that yeah. buzz for, for her sweet spot and the, and the coaching programs and such that I do. Mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. it, and I have a hard time with these lives and going live to generate mm -hmm. intention of sale or generating business. For me, mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard sale for me to do, but one that I do and <laughs> tell my clients that they have to get used to doing in order to really get them in, in, the, in, the, in the vibration of uh, video and connecting. Especially right, in this right. time, in this digital time. But Yvonne, I am so thankful, and I've had such a great time chatting with you today. I thank you so much for your time and sharing all your insights and dropping all these little nuggets. I'm sure you weren't realizing all the things you were sharing and dropping <laughs> <laughs> on us today. But I appreciate you. Continue to, if you guys are not following her, Yvonne McNair, she. I, I, if she has, if she has over capacity, just follow her so you can catch her when she is out here. Uh, uh, and I appreciate you for kind of pivoting because during the research um, that I did for you, I did learn a lot about you and um, your career. And I'm thankful to uh, know that, especially that you have a team of all black women. You are here for the culture and for the advancement of uh, women of color, Black women, which is what we do here at Her Sweet Spot. So thank you again for being our guests. Our guests are saying thank you to you as well. And bye-bye for now. All right. Thanks for having me.